Okay, so here's the 20th lecture. Um, we're going to discuss through the compactness in metric spaces. So before we've seen that in a metric space, compact is equivalent to low point compact as equivalent to sequentially compact. Now, if we relate it to completeness, we know that compact spaces are complete. Why? Because if you're compact, then you're sequentially compact, which means that every Cauchy sequence is a sequence, right? So every Cauchy sequence has a converging subsequence. But we know that this implies that X is complete. So compact implies complete. But what about the converse? <coughs> what about the converse? Right? So for here, we introduce a new definition, which is called totally bounded. Is that for any epsilon, there exists a finite covering of x by epsilon balls. Okay, so it is totally bounded. It is stronger than boundedness. Okay, it is stronger than bounded. Okay. So, how does that imply bounded? Well, if we just pick a random, like we we'll just say one over two. Then for any a b, we can use triangle inequality right so that the diameter is finite which means that x is bounded this is our definition but bounded does imply it's totally bounded because if we consider the bounded metric and reals oh well, r is bounded under d bar right if you think about the definition r is bounded under d bar but it is not totally bounded under d bar right and also if we let DAB to be the standard metric in R. R is complete but is not totally bounded. This is totally bounded but not complete. But this is totally bounded and it is a complete. Okay? So here comes a theorem. The theorem characterized compact spaces and metric space. So a metric space, a metric space. Is compact if only if it is complete and totally bounded. Okay? A metric space is complete if and only if it's only totally bounded. Okay, so first we have shown that compact and plus complete. And compactness also gives total boundedness. Okay, you can think about the definition. So this direction we're done. Okay? So this direction we're done. Now we want to show this direction, which is that we just show x is sequentially compact. Okay, we show that x is sequentially compact, so it suffices. Now, for any sequence, we construct a subsequence that is Cauchy. For any sequence, we construct a subsequence that is Cauchy, but x is complete, right? So this subsequence is Cauchy and subsequence converges, right? So X is sequentially compact, okay? So this is our idea. So for any sequence, we just construct a subsequence that is Cauchy. So to start, now I'll just cover X by one balls, then one of them contains infinitely many of them, of the X ends. So we let J1 be the indices that belongs to B1. So J1 must be infinite. Now, keep going, we cover it by 1 over 2 balls. Then there exists another ball that contains infinitely many x in, where n is in ji. Okay, so this must be true. Why? Because suppose all of them contains only finitely. If all of them contains only finitely, many x in, where n and ji. Now, there are only finitely many of the balls, and each ball contains only finite of them. So in total, right, there is only, which means that there is, there's in total only finitely many elements in J1, but J1 is infinite, right? So it must contain one that contains infinitely many x and is J1, which is like J2, be the indices where it's in B2, and it also in the indexes in J1. So from here, we can just inductively construct our sets, <coughs> right? So in general, if we're given a jk that is infinite, we define jk plus 1 to define like this, or 
the radius of BK plus 1 is 1 over K plus 1. And also JK plus 1 is infinite. Okay, so we can discuss, we can construct it in this way. So, <clears throat> yeah, so we know that, we know that J2 is infinite, right? J2 is also infinite. So now we just pick N1 and J1 and give it NK. We pick NK plus 1 and JK plus 1 such that NK plus 1 greater than NK. Well, this is possible because JM is infinite for all N, right? So we can just do this. So here we have picked in a strictly increase, increasing sequence of indices. And also we have this relation, right? So for any i, j greater equal to k, n, i, and a, j are in b, k. Which means that we have this. Right, b, k has radius what? 1 over k. Right? So we have this. Okay? Which means that x and i is Cauchy. Right? Think about it. If we have, if we have this. Right? This could be less influenced by the Archimedean property. So... <laughs> So now we show that compact infinitely of complete and totally bounded. Now for compact subspace of this function space in the uniform topology, we know the subspace is compact. Subspace of Rn is compact if only if it's close and bounded, but this does not hold in the um, in the function space even x is compact we need an extra condition and this condition is defined as follows so we're given the metric space and a subspe subset of the function space now we pick a point in x the collection f is equicontinuous at x naught if for any epsilon there's a neighborhood such that for all x in the neighborhood and for all f in the collection, we have this. So we have we can pick a neighborhood that works for all f. Okay. So this holds for if this holds for all x naught, then f is called equicontinuous. Okay. So we're gonna explore this notion. And here's a lemma. So the lemma states that. Space, metric space. Now, if the subset is totally bounded under the uniform metric corresponding to D, then it is equicontinuous under D. Okay? So, totally bounded under uniform uniform uh, metric, then it is equicontinuous. Okay? So, F is totally bounded, and for um, epsilon less than 1, X down in X, we want to find a neighborhood of x naught such that we have this for any x in u and for any f in f. So uh, we just let epsilon, uh, we just let delta equal to epsilon over three. We cover i f by the delta balls. Now since each f i is continuous, so we pick a u i such that this works for all finite f i's. Okay, this is possible because we're dealing with finite and finite intersection of open sets is open right now if f is an f f must be in some ball right which means that for any x and u we have we can take a look we have these three conditions so since delta less than one we can replace d bar with d then the triangle inequality gives that we have this so we're done Okay, and here's another lemma. So this lemma states that we have a partial converse of the preceding ones, which holds when x, y are both compact. So x is space, y is metric space, x, y are compact. So equicontinuous implies totally bounded on the soup, soup uh, uniform metric. So to prove it, so we're gonna use the compactness of x. As compact, so rho is defined on this space. 
totally bounded under row if only if it's totally bounded under row bar. So we just use row throughout. Now, we want to show that it's totally bounded, which means that for any epsilon, we want to cover f by finite epsilon balls under row. Again, we let delta equals to epsilon over 3. Now, for any point in the in, uh, x, we can find a neighborhood such that we have this, we're, all, we're given equal continuity, right? So we cover x by finite balls, say ui, right? Because for any a, there, there's a ua such that this condition holds, right? So we can cover x by the finitely many uai balls. We just call it ui, okay? So again, we cover y by the open sets, v1 to vm, such that the diameter of vi is less than delta. So we're using the compactness of y, but this is... If you just think about the delta over 2 balls, you just cover y with delta over 2 balls, right? Each of them has diameter less than delta, right? By the triangle inequality. And I just get a finite uh, cover, okay? So we let j denote the collection of all functions from 1 to k to 1 to n. So 1 to k. Let me let me i from one to k. Okay, so this is clear. So i is from one to k. So from one to k to one to m. So alpha is a function. Okay. So given alpha, if there's a function f such that we have this. Okay, f of a i is v of alpha i for all of them. We just choose it and label it as f alpha then f alpha is indexed by j prime that is a subset of j. But j is finite, right? There's there's only finitely many functions like this. So j prime is also finite. So here we just we check that this is a finite cover of f. <laughs> now let f and f for each i you can just pick alpha i such that f of a i is in v of i. Right? So this alpha is in J prime, okay? We have this, so alpha is in J prime, okay? Alpha is in J prime. So we show that this function f with this cor corresponding f alpha, we have this relation. Now, again, we have these three and we apply triangle inequality. This holds for all x, which means that the under the uniform metric it still holds, which means that f is in the ball right, by definition. Okay, so here we have another definition. It's called our pointwise bounded under D if for any alpha, f alpha, which is this set, is bounded under D. Okay, so it's a set of all, all f alpha where f is in f. So here we're gonna prove a theorem called a scholarly theorem. That is a classical version of it. So it is stated as follows. For a compact space, and this denotes the Euclidean space under Euclidean metric or square metric. We give this, we give this the corresponding uniform topology. Because X is compact, right? So the so it is defined. And the subspace, it has a compact closure if it only if it's equicondinous and pointwise bounded under D. Okay? So X is compact means the row is defined. Right? It would denote G as F bar in, in the space. So step one, we show this. Right? We want to show that we have a compact a compact closure, then we have these two, right? So here, we show that G is compact, and G is equicontinuous and pointwise bounded under D, right? Because F is subset of G, so F is equicontinuous and pointwise bounded under D, okay? So, first, G is compact, which means that G is totally bounded, right? Complete and totally bounded. So it's totally bounded on a row and row bar. 
And also, because um, G is equicontinuous under D by 45.2. If you're totally bounded, they're equicontinuous, right? And also, totally bounded implies it is bounded on a row. But if it's bounded on the row, this means that for any FG, we have this. Which means that if we fix an A, then we have this. Right, which means we have this, which means that G is pointwise bounded. So we're done. Okay. So step two, we we we're, with this direction we're done. Okay. So step two, we show that F is equicontinuous under D. So does G. So for here, we really using the fact that G is a closure of F. So, so for arbitrary small interval, right? No, for arbitrary small epsilon, right? First, we use the fact that f is equicontinuous. For g, we can choose another f such that it's arbitrarily close, right? And then by triangle inequality, we have this. And g is equicontinuous at f x naught. So does pointwise bounded. Okay. Now, if diameter f is less than m, g g prime, we pick f f prime such that they are close. Right? We use the fact that this is the closure of f. Okay. We have this, which means that since we have this, then we have this by the triangle inequality and gg prime arbitrary, so their diameter is less than this. <laughs> okay. Step three, we show that if g is equicontinuous and pointwise bounded, then there exists a compact set in Rn such that we have this. This is an another result. Okay. So for each A, we could pick a neighborhood UA such that we have this, okay? Now, X is compact, so we can just cover X by finally many UA, I. Each, um, we know that G is pointwise bounded, right? So each G, A, I is bounded under D. So does their finite union. Okay, so that's their finite union, which means that we just let this light in a ball with radius n centered at zero. Okay, which means that, well, we can just do this, right? So for any g, um, for any g, we can fix x naught such that this, so we have this, this by above, right? This by above, we, 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 we choose this, we have u a. So for each x naught must be in some u a i. So we have x naught and g a i is less than one, and g of a i is in the ball. So for g x naught it is an n plus one, but x naught is arbitrary. So g x lies in the ball, and we just let y be the closure of the ball. Then we have this is true. Okay, so the closure of the ball is compact. It's closed and bounded. All right. So now, we're going back. So if f is equal continuous point when it's bounded under d, we show that g is complete and totally bounded on the row, which means that g is compact. To show g is complete, first, since Rn is complete, so this space is also complete because x is compact, okay? Now, g is a closed subspace of this, so g is also complete. So here we're done. We just show that it is totally bounded. But step two, we're given f is blah 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 blah, right? So step two show that g is also blah 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 blah. And again, if g is blah 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 blah, we know that this is contained in some compact space, right? We have this. Well, from here, this means that g is a subset of c x y. You can think about it why, right? Gx, the image set, is in y, right? So for any element, g and g, gx is in y, right? So it is a continuous function. It's a continuous function from x to y, right? Now let's see, right? So as g is continuous, uh, equi equicontinuous, right? 
this we have g is equicontinuous then because x and y are both compact remember our partial converse right our partial converse states that x y are compact this is equicontinuous then it's totally bounded on the road equicontinuous totally bounded on the road so it's totally bounded on the road complete so we have finished our theorem okay so this is the this is the classical Ascoli theorem classical version okay so that's it for the lecture thank you